Good morning and welcome to First Parish in Portland, a warm and welcoming place in the heart of the city. Also a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, where our mission is to nurture the spirit, build community, and help heal the world. I am Reverend Elaine paris Lua, and I am your interim minister, which means that there's a search committee out there somewhere looking for a new settled minister, and we send them our love and hope and support. They were here, I think, three nights last week. Yes, two, oh, two. There will be more. Every week, I like to remind you that we are a welcoming congregation, which means that we welcome you, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whoever you love, whatever your gender identity, whatever your faith tradition, and whatever your age. So welcome to all. And that last one is for our wee ones. I want to remind you every week that by learning the names of our children, by smiling and nodding at them and their families, no matter what their chortles are or their movements or their little giggles, we know that that is a sign of the vitality of the future of this congregation. So welcome to all our weest ones. And every week, we also acknowledge that where this building exists, where it was built, and where the previous historic buildings were built, were the lands of ancestral people, the first people of the state of Maine, the tribes of the Wabanaki Confederation, and the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Micmac were stewards of this land for generations until the Europeans came and as invaders and colonists perpetuated genocide and stole land. Now, when we acknowledge this, we do it not because it makes a difference when we acknowledge it, or that it's enough that we acknowledge it. We do that every week to remind us who we are and what the history of this uh, congregation is. And in knowing that history, we are able to continue to build relations and repair damage that was done in the past. And we are starting our history initiative, the transition team and several other volunteers and I. So you will notice that there will be a historic visitor almost every Sunday from now until November when we create a historic theatrical social event that will bring the whole history and timeline of this 350 year old institution into your forefront. Because with that history in your minds, you will know exactly who you are in the past, who you are now, and who you want to be in the future. And that will help you choose the very best next minister. So with all that, I invite you to enjoy, oh, no, two other announcements. I've had requests to know about the status of masks and the COVID team will be meeting as soon as Kip and Barbara get back from Iceland. So that's not next week, but the week after. And we'll talk about our protocols, what we can change, what we can loosen, what we need to keep in place, and we will let you know about those. I also want you to know that the Wabanaki Ally team is doing a food drive. It was very successful this last year, and they're repeating it this year, and you can find a list of all the foods that are appropriate to contribute um, on our website. Um, and we'll be starting it this Sunday and carrying it through till October 9th, which is our uh, Indigenous Peoples Celebration. So bring in your food now. Enjoy Jonathan's Prelude.
Make room. Make room for the one who's terribly new and single and lonely. Make room. Make room. Make room for the one who has just lost a child, a parent, a sibling, a friend, who's grieving and hurting in need of a lot. Make room. Make room. Make room for the Christian, the Buddhist, the agnostic, the atheist, the Jew, and not. Make room. Make room for the elders, the ones who've retired, who miss the respect, the authority, the challenge, the power, though not so much that they'd go back to work, but wistfully wishing you'd listen to them. Make room. Make room. Make room for the child who's noisy, eats too many cookies, and certainly doesn't behave like your children did. Make room. And make room for the parents of children, too. Make room for the teachers, the parents, the singers and not, the lawyer, the plumber, the farmer, the cop, for those who give of their spirits, their time, their wealth, and those who do not. Make room. Make room. Make room for the one who dominates, who has all the answers, who talks too much, too loud, too strong, who's disorganized, who forgets. Make room. Make room. Make room for the one whose speech is different than yours, whose clothes are different than yours, whose origins, partner, identity, history, and ancestors are different from yours. By glory, make room. By compassion, make room. By grace, make room. By all that is in us, with us, over us, and around us. Spirit of life that is our God around us, little and big, make room. Make room. I invite you to rise in body or spirit and sing number 346. Come sing a song with me and be sure to turn the page. All the verses. I forgot does not turn the page. My apology.
and we'll say, say our chalice lighting words together. They're printed in your order of service. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is our sacrament, and service is our prayer. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Good morning. Can you all hear me okay? Let's try this. That's not what I meant to do. Sam can hold it for you. I like when we have new things, but it takes a minute to get used to them. Um, speaking of new things, you might have noticed that I have some new glasses on today. I'd love to tell you all about them, but first I need to call up anyone who is a child or a child at heart. And if you are a child and you're coming up and you would feel better if you brought your adult, you can go ahead and ask your adult to come up with you. We'll, we'll allow that. So come on forward. I know we have a couple of friends that might be shy, but we'd love to have you come up if you're willing. The fun part about wearing sunglasses is that I can sort of kind of see a little bit, but it just sort of looks like dark blobs. Here we go. All right. Hi, come on over. So I see Soren and Lars and Anders. There's a spot right here if you want to sit right down here. Would that be okay? So Reverend Elaine just said, I bet you wish you had glasses. Do you wish that you had some cool sunglasses on like me? You want some? No? Well, let me tell you about them, and maybe you'll change your mind. Let's see. So these are my gratitude glasses, and I'll tell you about why I needed them and where I got them. So you might have noticed I'm walking with a cane, which is just not super fun, but this summer I got a new hip. So my old hip wasn't working that great. The doctor said you need a new one, so I got a new hip. Um, and what happens when you get a new hip is that you have to lay in bed for like a lot of days and it's not super fun. And about halfway through laying in bed for like day number 72, which was really like probably day five, but it felt like day 72, um, I was like, I just want my old hip back. <laughs> that was like, it hurt and like, but it was, I knew that pain, I knew how to get through it. With this new hip, it was very hard to move around. I couldn't walk yet on my own. I had to use a walker. I had to ask for help, which is just, never fun. So I really just wanted to, I was mad and I just wanted my old hip back, but it was too late because I had already gotten this new one. And somebody suggested that maybe I could change the way I was looking at it. And so they gave me these glasses and they said, maybe if you could look at it with some gratitude, you would feel a little bit better. Does anybody, can you tell me what gratitude is? Do you know Lars? It's another word for saying being thankful. Do you know what it means to be thankful? Yeah. So when I took these glasses and I put them on, and I'm, I'm going to see if you, if, if you feel it too. We try a pair, see if you feel grateful. You can pick any pair you want in there. I got a lot of pairs. Oh, solid choice. You know, I thought you were going to go for those. Oh, would you, would you bring Jonathan? Would you bring Jonathan? That's the guy over there on the piano. Would you bring these to him? All right. So go ahead and put them on. Do you, do you feel immediately grateful? You do? Yeah. What are you grateful for, Sam? I am really grateful for running water these days. I've been thinking a lot about Jackson, Mississippi, and I, yeah, I'm really grateful every time I get to take a nice hot shower or take a cold glass from the, from the tap. Very grateful for water these days. 
I am really, really grateful that I finished that grant by four o'clock on Friday. Oh, and I am so grateful to see so many people here. It is wonderful to stand up there. And I'm so grateful for the people that I know are out there watching in the live stream too. Hello, we're so glad you're with us and maybe you can find some glasses in your house to put on. Do any of you feel grateful? Do you feel thankful for anything? No? Well, okay, here's the thing. I'm so glad you're here because we're gonna talk about gratitude and a bunch of other things, but also, turns out that glasses are a metaphor. They don't actually do the work for you. It's just a reminder that sometimes if you're not feeling happy with something, you can think about what around you you do have that maybe other people don't have and that you can feel grateful for. And it really did for me this summer, it did a lot of good because a lot of people brought me nice treats and took care of me when I wasn't feeling really well. And so even though I was in a lot of pain, I got to feel really grateful that people took the time to think about me and take care of me, which is, you don't necessarily get to have that happen if you don't have your hip replaced. So it was, it was pretty wonderful. So, now with our grateful hearts and our grateful glasses, we are going to sing the children up to their classroom. I'm still going to be grateful when I take the glasses off. So now's the time of the service where I try to balance that, the sort of all the elements that I think are important in a Sunday morning gathering, some spiritual moments, some provocative moments, some fun moments, some serious moments. So I want you to begin today's meditation by looking at the signs on the balcony rails. One says, a warm and welcoming place in the heart of the city. The other says, open the windows, the doors, receive whosoever is sent. They are the theme of today's service, which is about, and actually the whole month, this whole month of September, we're focusing on what it means to be a welcoming congregation. So, I want you to get comfortable in your chairs, your pews. Invite some spaciousness in your mind, whether that's through your breath or closing your eyes. Lift your shoulders straight up as far as you can to your ears and then Roll them back and feel the expansiveness in your chest and lower your shoulders. Breathe. Listen to the sound of the fan. Make yourself ready for whatever it is you arrived here today, either to give or to receive. And let these words, Robert Frost, take you to that place. Something there is that doesn't love a wall that sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two could pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone 
on a stone. They would have the rabbit out of hiding to please their yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made. But at spring, mending time, we find them. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go to each the boulders that have fallen to each. And some are loaves and some nearly balls. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned at least. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another good outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to little more. There where it is, we do not need a wall. He is all pine and I am all apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a new notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall wants it down. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly. And I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, it seems to me not of wood, woods only, in the shade of trees. He will not let go his father's saying. And he likes having thought of it so well, he says it again. Good fences make good neighbors. Do they? I thought there was a visitor here today.
does not look like Henry Longfellow. Almost 200 years ago, the governing board of this church made a fateful decision. It was to tear down the old wooden structure that had served generations of parishioners and build this bricks and mortar uh, structure that we have today. At the time, it was a very controversial decision. Um, there was a lot of blowback from very troubled members of the, of the community. And one of those protesters was a 17-year-old student who was so upset, angry, frustrated that he sat down and penned a poem. That poem appeared in the Portland Advertiser on September the 25th, 1824. A week from today exactly, almost 200 years ago. So, It is, the poet, it is the poem of a very young man who is extremely frustrated, hurt, and angry, and wanting to let people know that this is a terrible thing that the Board of Trustees is about to do. The poem is titled, Old Parish Church. Our Father's temple, o'er thy form in peace, time's holy writ falls. Yet heavenly light glows pure and warm around thy venerable walls. The shades of years have mellowed long, but not obscured that light of God, though they that place thee here shall throng no more the courts where once they trod. Alas, o'er the old time hath cast the mournful mantle of decay. His feet have over thy threshold passed, his hand hath plucked thy strength away. Nor think we, as we gaze on thee, how soon the hand that seals thy doom shall waste our own vitality and hide our ashes in the tomb. And hark to heaven, the tuneful song in soft and solemn music steals. And now the anthem swells and long the solemn breathing organ peals. My soul to earth resigns its fears, flushed with the glowing dream of heaven. It sees thy, spent, thy sainted sires and hears the song of peace and sins forgiven. Ye holy men of God, beloved, who bow forever at his throne, ye in whose breasts his spirit moved, whose thoughts and lives were all his own. Within this temple, when below, the precepts of his love ye gave. And shall his temple perish now without one hand outstretched to save? 
Thou hoary monarch, time, a while from ruin spare this holy place. Shall peace desert the hallowed isle and mercy's cherub veil her face? Still may our Father's temple shine, the record of departed years. Still may we worship at its shrine, still bathe its altar in our tears. Pointing to heaven, our resting place, thy spire its ancient form uprears, and still upon thy wall we trace the gray and gathering moss of years. Still from thy tower the deep-toned bell, time's silent lapse proclaims on high, still breathes its long and last farewell to perishing mortality. Now, as at eve, with solemn feet, thy consecrated aisles I tread. Those that surround the mercy seat seem here unto thine altar led. I see the venerable band, the patriarchs of our infant church. I see the weak and trembling hand, again the heavenly volume search. And as the eye grown dim in time, with awe reviews the inspired page, I hear the voice of truth sublime break quivering from the lips of age. Kneeling around thine altar old, those holy men have joined in prayer that Israel's God would keep his fold and bless the shepherd of his care. Thank you, Henry. Rules, decisions, walls. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, wants it down. There are good walls, there are not so good walls. The laws of right and wrong, covenants, governance, bylaws, right relationship, guidelines, respecting one's space, walls of good manners, good walls, maintained by mending, walking the line together, replacing stones, deciding together. Good fences do make good neighbors. There are also walls that hurt, that isolate, Walls built to keep others out, to source power in a few, keeping pine from apple. The walls of prejudice, sexism, racism, binary gender identities, hatred, fear, ignorance. There are hoarding walls that keep too much for too few, some not enough for others, bad walls that tear apart the very fabric of our communities, our world, our relationships. We need to always know what we are walling in or what we are walling out. When are we being biased, rigid, authority making an exclusive decision about something as historic and meaningful as a building. When are we being predictable, consistent, creating safety and norms? And what is First Parish's response to walls? 
Are there lots of rants and complaints? Or do people respect decisions by leaders? Is there an inclusive conversation when a huge decision is made? We'll make sure we look into history and see how that decision was made over these next few months. How do you shape your expectations around compliance? Do you get upset when someone doesn't follow the rules or get upset when rules are made? Do you get frustrated with the people who make rules or frustrated with the ones who break them? Do we all stretch ourselves to be respectful about the needs of the community rather than the needs of one individual? How do we prioritize the walls? I wonder if you can think of some walls that have been erected here that have served you. Think for a minute. Welcoming congregation rules about welcoming our gay, lesbian, transgender, non-binary friends into the congregation. Are there walls that you have supported? Maybe walls that you have resisted? Have rules helped to shape the safety and inclusion of the community or not? Governance, policy-based versus committee-based. Who has access to leadership and how is that known or not known? Who knows how decisions are made? Who does not? Whose voices are included? whose are not. What is it about some rules that invite folks to ignore them and do exactly as they please? I have a bit of experience with that in my very short tenure here, trying on an unfamiliar behavior or inviting some sort of change. And I've heard a few downright dismissive comments. I've seen or eyes roll in a meeting because of something I suggested. And I have seen staff receive similar comments and responses when they have suggested something out of their professional experience that might be helpful. Have any of you ever felt that your tastes your personal life and choices, your desire to sing out or to be quiet, to move or to sit still, to applaud or not, was something you either had to restrain or you could express yourself fully. Did you receive a curled lip or a clucking tongue or an eye roll? In some you congregations, it's a big fight over neckties or not. I'm not thinking that's going on here. <laughs> Maybe it's tattoos or not. Perhaps it's your age, the color of your hair. If you ever felt that a certain political idea was unwelcome here, that something you wore or said would invite judgment or laughter, did you feel that you could not be fully yourself? Perhaps it's the word prayer rather than meditation, or meditation rather than prayer. Maybe it's the singing of a doxology or not, a sermon, a reference to scripture. Perhaps everyone is expected to watch CNN or public television, not Fox. Or perhaps Classical music is revered, and country western, not so much. Being Christian and celebrating and wearing a cross. Perhaps it is your wealth or lack of it. Justice that's at the center and core of your being, and not spirituality or spirituality 
not social justice. If you have ever felt limited in your being by any one of these expectations, raise your hand. Look around. And I bet you have some other things that I haven't mentioned. Hmm? A warm and welcoming place in the heart of the city. A welcoming place is a community that makes room, listens respectfully even if you disagree, and does not cluck their tongue or roll their eyes, no matter what someone says in a meeting. Something that doesn't love a wall wants it down. We try hard to build walls, maintain them. Some are for self-protection, for our own space. Don't cross this line. I start here, you start here. This is my time, my community. You are an outsider. We all build them walls, good walls and bad walls, boundaries of respectful relationship, judgments of what is wrong or acceptable, good walls, bad walls. Good walls are essential for loving, consistent, predictable relationships, friends, lovers, parents. We all know the pitfalls of not knowing when to say yes or no. And when we know what the expectations are, it makes it easier to move through society. Have you ever showed up at a party, a dinner event, wearing exactly the wrong thing? Too much or too little? There's a discomfort in it until people smile and nod and let you know it's not important but it takes those smiles and nods to let you know it's not important. My most favorite story of the queen, heard it years ago, was she had this royal banquet and all these, you know, one of those tables that was probably as long as this aisle here, and she's at the end of one, and, you know, all the people are there, and somebody inadvertently drops their glass and spills and smashes glass and wine all over the floor. The queen looks up, picks up her glass, drops it on the floor. It's okay. We all spill our glasses once in a while. She set the standard of welcoming and warmth. Unitarian Universalism is fundamentally a relational religion. We have a covenant with seven principles. We do covenant to affirm and promote, and then we have our seven principles. It's something anyone who is a member of a congregation that is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations promises to try their best to uphold. Walls good walls. And we all have trouble with some of them. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's harder. They need to be flushed out, revisited, talked about, made relevant in each and every instance. You don't always know when it's the right thing to respect the dignity and worth of every human being. Some of you have asked me to do a sermon on this because right now it's sometimes really hard to know who to respect and how to respect the dignity and worth and of that person. You can all fill in your that. Well, we can respect the dignity and worth of every person. The principle is secure. What we need to flush out and make relevant is what behaviors are unacceptable. What is hurtful to community? What is hurtful to another human being? We can respect people 
we can appreciate the dignity and worth of every person while also holding every person accountable to appropriate behavior. And that's kind of where the rub is, because who decides what's appropriate? It takes constant conversation, awareness, a decision together. Not one person gets to decide. We have historically embraced in our denomination both individual rights and through that covenant, a relational understanding of responsibility to one another. And that's the rub, isn't it? Does the first principle mean that we accept all behaviors? No, but it does mean that we respect the person and decide what wall we will build up to assure respectful behaviors. And we must continually evaluate. Are we historically shunning some orthodoxy or building our own new orthodoxies? Have we developed a subtle, maybe sometimes not so subtle way of sending a message that certain things are not acceptable here? It is that first principle that helps us remember that there is a balance that is continually evolving and that the thing that we do avoid is those exclusive orthodoxies. Think about it. Just a little. Henry Wyman was a Unitarian Universalist. He was a famous theologian. He'd been a Presbyterian minister, and he was ordained as a UU minister, and he wrote a book called The Source of Human Good. After the first atomic bomb was dropped, he realized that technology had gotten way, way out of left field that we now had this destructive power, that there was no equivalent requirement of human goodness to prevent such a thing. And historically, it had been religion and a god, a, a fearful god, a punitive god that condemned people to eternity and hell that had kept people kind of in line. But technology and secularism and distance from that sort of god made it not so important anymore. So he looked for a source of human good that would hold us accountable as we developed treacherous new technologies. He called it the creative instant. That instant when two people talk together and neither one of them turns out to be right and they realize that there's something greater than either one of them could have created on their own. And there's a respectful listening and sharing and dialogue that creates a new instance. The source of human good is our relationships. The source of human good is talking and listening to one another so that you come up with something better than could have been done before. 375 years ago, at the very beginning of our universalist faith, John Winthrop told those who were departing England for this country what the journey would mean. 
he said, the only way to provide for the posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah, to do justly, to love mercy, and walk humbly together with our God. For this end, we must knit together in this work as one. As we move forward in this interim period, as you discover what is most essential to the identity of this congregation, we must knit together in this work as one. Only a community of equals, talking honestly and caringly to each other, listening caringly to each other, can approach the vision that will carry this congregation vitally into the next decade. Somewhere in between that 350th year ago, with all of things that were done that you may disagree with, and today, there is an opportunity to learn, to share, to discover something new, to discover the relationship between what has been and what can be. Make room. Make room. And I see the ushers waiting to come down the aisle to receive your offerings, small and large, that sustain this congregation, this building, everything about First Parish in Portland is you. Please be generous. Quit your addiction to sneer or complain. Try a little flaunt. Call for comrades who bolster your vim and offer you risk. Stay up all night to devise a new dawn. 
The world is your courtroom. There is no judge, no jury, no plaintiff. This, this is a caravan filled with eccentric beings telling wondrous stories about love. Join in. And join in by rising in body or spirit to sing Building a New Way. You either have one of these or you have a piece of paper with the music and lyrics. It's number 10, 17. You guys are going to get really good at that one before I leave here. We're going to like rousingly do that. Let's join together in the unison benediction and extinguish. Oh, before I do that, I would like to thank Eric for being on our tech today. Eric Sawyer's here. And thank Devin Medeiros because Eric wouldn't be here if it weren't for Devin organizing that. And I want to thank Tobin, who's not here, is with the kids. And I want to thank Jonathan and Benjamin and Lori. Every Sunday, it takes a village to make this happen. And you should know that Tobin and I were both here at 7 this morning, getting us all ready. So, and Mo, thank you all. Now the chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment, which we'll sing next week. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Namaste. Remember, there is a worship committee meeting, now called the Sunday Gathering Meeting, upstairs with lunch for those who want to be part of that team. You need to say it to me so I can, and then I'll say it through the mic. The intro to paganism is three to five in the parish hall this afternoon. Free to church members, five dollars for non-members. There you go. Enjoy. <laughs>